Hi, I'm Robert Byrne from the Deutsches Herz Centrum in Munich. I'm here at uh, ESC 2011 in the sunny Paris, France, and I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Granger from uh, Durham, North Carolina, who's just presented some very exciting results from Aristotle and really, I think, captured the imagination of the uh, attendees here at ESC 2011. Uh, Dr. Granger, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Robert. So we had some um, upfront uh, results or some upfront uh, data on this some months ago from the Aristotle trial, but it's really exciting now to have the hard uh, figures and it's a presentation that's been very well received. Can you give us some background into the conduct of this study uh, and uh, what hypothesis you were testing? Yeah, and really the, the background is that warfarin is a very effective drug for preventing stroke in atrial fibrillation but it has all the limitations that we know about as, as practitioners and, and, uh, and that our patients experience with a, with a drug that's not particularly convenient, that has a lot of interactions, um, and that has a fair amount of bleeding. And I think it's becoming increasingly apparent that there's a liability of warfarin with respect to intracranial hemorrhage. Yeah. And that's a theme that's come up now, not just from Aristotle, but from, from Rely, from Rocket, um, from Averroes, from each of these trials that's comparing these novel anticoagulants um, to, uh, to warfarin or, or aspirin, that, that warfarin has this, um, this high rate of intracranial hemorrhage that can be avoided with the use of these, um, of these other drugs. So, so that's the background um, that, that we've been really, um, I think, searching and hoping for alternatives to warfarin for some time. And the good news is now they're here. Yeah. We have very effective alternatives. And the hope five or six years ago was that we would have something equally effective as this very effective treatment warfarin, but without the limitations. Now we're very excited that we have much more than that. And this is good news for patients and for the practice of, um, of management of atrial fibrillation. And, and this is what, um, what was strongly reinforced with Aristotle, um, now the latest trial. So in Aristotle, we took the broad population of patients yeah. with atrial fibrillation who had at least one CHADS risk factor. We had about 18,000 patients. And they were randomly assigned to a Pixaban, five milligrams twice a day, or to a small portion, about 5% of the population who was at higher risk for bleeding and, and, and had two of three factors of older age higher creatinine or lower body weight um, versus, um, uh, and then they got 2.5 milligrams um, twice a day versus warfarin with an INR target of two to three. Importantly, the, uh, the time and therapeutic range of the INR yeah. supported the idea that patients were well treated in the warfarin arm. We had a median time and range of 66%. Lars Valentin has presented very nice data showing a consistency of the effects that we saw with apixaban across different um, center performance in terms yeah. of time and therapeutic yeah. range. Yeah. But the key results of the trial then, I mean this double blind, uh, double dummy trial, were first of all, and, and we actually had a sequence, we had four hypotheses, yeah. and we did them in a sequence, yeah. so you had to meet each one before going to the next to maintain yeah. the integrity. So this of the is statistics. to try to overcome um, the limitations of multiple hypothesis testing and correction for that. Is that exactly. correct? Exactly. Okay. So, so you had a hierarchical a system. Um, the first uh, uh, in the step was a non-inferiority design. Is that right? That's right, and that's what we hoped for in the beginning. That's what all these trials have been: is non-inferiority. Yeah. So we met that yeah. with high statistical. So that let us go on to test for superiority. And in fact, it picks in 21% relative risk reduction in stroke or systemic embolism um, compared to warfarin. So, so a, a big benefit, statistically significant, p-value 0.01. So that's exciting, yeah. something better than warfarin. Now, of course, um, uh, dabigatran, 150 milligrams, also had superiority um, to warfarin. I mean, that open-label trial with the two different doses of, of dabigatran. So we have a couple of drugs that are superior, and rivaroxaban, um, that had the point estimate was for benefit compared to warfarin as well. Mm -hmm. So, so really, a, some consistency in the drugs can be better than warfarin in stroke prevention. Then, the, then we could go on and test for superiority with respect to safety. So, yeah. our primary yeah. safety outcome, um, ISTH major bleeding, and the most remarkable finding in many ways of the Aristotle program was was that in the context of a more effective drug, we also have a safer drug. Yeah. 31% relative risk reduction. This is a big effect yeah. on reducing bleeding. Yeah. And that, that included 
a 49% reduction in hemorrhagic stroke and a 58% um, reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. So, yeah. and, and major bleeding by Timmy and gusto criteria reduced by about 50%. So, yeah. so that was uh, that was very impressive. And what are we attributing this to? I mean, you mentioned this up front that this may be a class effect with uh, oral factor 10 A inhibitors. Is it to do with uh, time spent out or above the therapeutic range with warfarin, or is it due to the mechanism of action of the oral uh, 10 A inhibitors? So the, the intracranial hemorrhage yeah. reduction, which is which is seen with all these, I, I, we don't know is the yeah. answer. But but yeah. many people are are hypothesizing that warfarin perhaps through its effect on factor seven or maybe the factor seven tissue factor complex that's important for brain hemeostasis mm -hmm. particularly um, is affected more by warfarin than it is by these, uh, by these other agents. Um, but, it, but it's an important finding. Now, in Aristotle, with respect to the stroke reduction, um, we had about, about two thirds of the stroke reduction was in Intracranial was in hemorrhagic stroke, so most of our benefit on stroke reduction was uh, was on hemorrhagic stroke. Then we had, so then we got, so we got through the first sure. three. Yeah. Then we have kind of the holy grail. The yeah. fourth was mortality. Yeah. Turns out more patients die who have atrial fibrillation than have strokes. So mm. it's a big, yeah. it's a big issue. Survival in, uh, in atrial fibrillation is is uh, is is of course a major um, um, issue as well. Yeah. And we found. In, in with our with our hierarchical testing, a statistically significant reduction in all-cause mortality, an 11% relative risk reduction, p-value was was um, was barely statistically significant, but statistically significant p-value 0.047, and I think that really gives us a lot of confidence in the overall findings, the overall effect on on uh, patient outcome, the fact that that uh, that all-cause mortality mm. uh, was also reduced. This is also importantly in the context of a drug that was better tolerated than warfarin. So we had fewer patients that had study drug discontinuation yeah. on apixaban um, than on warfarin. We had less gastrointestinal bleeding with apixaban than warfarin. We had fewer myocardial infarctions with apixaban than warfarin. We had an excellent safety profile. So mm. really, there, there, um, it, it, it really was, I, I think, a remarkably consistent benefit across all these different domains with apixaban yeah. versus yeah. warfarin. A final question then, maybe, uh, where do you see the future for this drug outside of uh, atrial fibrillation? I know there are some studies exploring its role, for example, in acute coronary syndrome. Do you think this is something that we're likely to see pr more promising results about in the future? So these um, novel oral anticoagulants look like they're very effective and some have been approved for VTE treatment mm. and prophylaxis. Um, for acute coronary syndromes, it's, it's a challenging area and, and part of the challenge is that there's an overlap too with atrial fibrillation and acute coronary syndromes. And what we've seen, I think the theme in the last year or two has been that, that one needs to be very careful in adding an anticoagulant on top of aspirin and clopidogrel mm. in the setting of acute coronary syndrome, particularly in coronary stenting, um, which um, um, w where we see in the observational studies that warfarin, aspirin, and clopidogrel seem to increase bleeding by about fourfold. Mm. The APRAISE-2 trial stopped early because of, of an expected increased risk of bleeding, but without an, a countervening um, benefit in terms of further reduction of ischemic events. Likewise, the thrombin receptor antagonist program, the DSMB, yeah. um, having some concerns in bleeding, even with that very safe agent on top of aspirin and clopidogrel. The one area which is still ongoing is rivaroxaban in yeah. the ATLAS trial is still ongoing. It'll be mm -hmm. very interesting to see whether rivaroxaban, whether the dose of rivaroxaban studied in the ATLAS program hits the sweet spot of something where there still mm -hmm. might be some additional benefit yeah. that counterbalances the risk. In the meantime, I think the message for clinicians is to be very careful um, with adding an, an anticoagulant on top of aspirin and clopidogrel. Yeah, okay. Well, I think all that remains is uh, for me to uh, thank you for coming here today and uh, offer my congratulations again on a fantastic study. I know that we can uh, read further details about this in the New England Journal uh, with a simultaneous publication, and uh, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Robert.